can effectively begin by uh, what I always have to do when we start these sessions is by thanking you for being here today on this lovely Friday afternoon for us here in India. Uh, I know a lot of you have, uh, have, have, uh, you have are in between work or college and so on and so forth and are still tuning in. So, so thank you so much for that, right? Um, and of course, it's, it's afternoon for us. It's also evening for uh, our guests from Malaysia. So they'll be looking to, to enjoy the weekend once this is over, right? Yep. <laughs> so, so good times. Uh, we're extremely pleased to welcome again all of you to our latest FAIR Dialogue with Ms. Zaina Anwar, who is the founding member of Sisters in Islam and the executive director of Musava. The topic of conversation today is one which perhaps uh, very accurately captures what all of us at the FAIR project are trying to do, right? which is learning to inquire, unlearning, and relearning in an attempt to find answers. And basing those answers on facts and sound reasoning, not just believing what is told to us, but at the same time being willing to accept uh, alternate views and uh, agree and just change our thought process when we are wrong, right? Which is the, probably the most crucial part of this entire exercise that, that we, we are running with all of you. Now, all of this, of course, hopefully culminates into fair outcomes, and that's the real objective of this exercise. Uh, and outcomes which not just benefit a few, but benefits all, right? Now, in this entire process, very often, the challenge in attempting to achieve something of this sort uh, requires us to question the conventional, as what we've done in the past as well, right? Now, the biggest challenge to this is recognizing that conventions also need to be questioned in the first place. Today, we'll be questioning one such convention, which on some levels has become acceptable to absolutely everyone on this planet in some way or the other. Religion, or actually more accurately, the manner in which religion has been interpreted over the years. Now, while religion is personal to each individual, certain interpretations of religion are, of course, more prominent than others. These interpretations go on to form laws, establish common practices, and determine the rights and wrongs for all of its followers. Now, you heard me say this many times before, right? Uh, when we've spoken about different faiths like Hinduism, Christianity, the Baha'i faith, uh, and of course, Islam as well. My struggle has always been to constructively comment on these religions without having read their original text, right? And where I'm always happy to have a conversation on religion based on my readings, which, which you've, you've heard before, my worry has always been whether we have sufficient context in order to form a meaningful opinion. Now, needless to say, this context uh, it just differs from time to time, right? The contexts of the present are different from the context of the past. The interpreters who interpret religion in the present differ from those in the past, right? So how can we reconcile faith with the realities and challenges of today? How do we account for the multiple discourses that are relevant differently for different stakeholders? If different realities uh, stem, obviously, different beliefs in the same faith, whose belief is the right belief? Our guest today, Zaina, uh, has asked and answered these questions and continues to do so for, for many, many years. She found that her faith in Islam, and, I, and I'm speaking for her, and then she's of course happy to correct me, uh, was perhaps not reflected in the way that it, is, it was being practiced in, in today's age, right? Especially with, when it comes down to the treatment of women. The question she therefore posed was quite simple, yet extremely complex to understand, let alone answer, in my opinion. Whose Islam is the right Islam? All right, and that's what she will be speaking to us about uh, in great depth once I'm done with this introduction. Um, Zaina, and just, just a couple more lines before I, I, I call her uh, to address all of us. She's been working for years to establish women rights within the Islamic framework, right? Um, through her work with Sisters in Islam and Musawa, she has focused on the legal framework of laws rooted in religion, especially Islamic family law. Right, so I'm not going to take more, much more of anyone's time and uh, would like to invite Zaina to uh, come and address us because there is so much that we have to learn from her and are eagerly waiting to hear what, what, what she has to say. So Zaina, uh, it's over to you now. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ramit. Good. Is it morning or afternoon for all of you? Um, afternoon. In different parts of India. Good afternoon, everyone. Really, thank you so much um, for this opportunity to share my work with this very important select group of young leaders in India. And I'm really heartened to know that um, you know, many of you are interested in understanding Islam better and not least Islam and women's rights, you know, which of course has been central um, to my life and my work over the past you know, 30 years, some 30 years. And really today as the world undergoes major political, economic, public health upheavals, the profound rethinking that needs to take place to find solutions to the gross inequalities and injustices of today I believe must necessarily include the urgency to address the centuries-old discrimination against women. Not just in the Muslim community, but in all communities, whether in the global south or the global north within Muslim, Hindu, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist communities, in law and in practice. And I'm really here, um, as um, Ramit said, to share with you the work of Muslim women activists like myself today who are engaged in bridging, in, in bringing about change in the way my religion is understood and used as a source of law, policy and practice. And this is what's happening in the Muslim world and that's why the engagement with Islam in the Muslim world is so critical because until today it is a source of law, yeah, uh, that, and, and that governs our daily lives. And unfortunately, in ways that often discriminate against us women and see us as the inferior half of the human race. As a Muslim woman who believes in an Islam that is just and a God that is just, I am outraged at how the religion I love, the God I love, has been hijacked by authoritarian forces who have turned it into a faith that I cannot recognize. An authoritative God, an authoritative, authoritative text has been abused for authoritarian purposes. What are the choices before us? As feminists, you know, as a feminist, I could turn my back on religion, as so many Muslim feminists and human rights activists have done all over the world. Forget about Islam, forget about religion, inherently unjust and patriarchal. Let's focus our struggle for equality and justice from within the human rights framework. However, I am a believer, and turning my back on God was simply not just an option for me. I, feel, I felt compelled to understand my religion better, to ask questions, to search for answers, to reconcile the disconnect between my faith. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, many, many, many um, feminists have turned their back on religion, but I felt that was not an option for me because I grew up with my religion and I grew up in an utter faith in a, God, in a just God and a just Islam. You know, and I really didn't want to choose, to be forced to choose between being a Muslim and a feminist, being a Muslim and a human rights activist. So in 1987, before many of you were born, yeah, most of you were not born, all of you maybe were not born. Um, in 1987, before Islam became fashionable in the world, um, a few friends and I co-founded a group called, and Ramit mentioned, the Sisters in Islam. So that was like over... 30 years ago, at a time when Malaysia, like many other Muslim countries, were enveloped by the forces of Islamic revivalism, by the rise of political Islam, dominated by conservative patriarchal voices that saw women as inferior to men and translated this belief into law, policy, and practice. So as working professional women, independent women, financially independent women, we were sick and tired of being told over and over again on radio, television, in the mosque, in talks, in private homes, by newly minted preachers paddling in Islam that made no sense to the realities of our lives. 
that men are superior to women. A man has a right to four wives. A man has a right to beat his wife. A man has a right to demand obedience. You know, go back home and be a good wife and everything will be okay. That's the advice that women were getting when they go to the Sharia courts or to religious departments to complain about the problems they were facing. So the question before us is, I mean, for me as a believer, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't understand, I couldn't believe, you know, that God could be unjust to half the human race. And that was the question I was asking and my friends were asking. For me, God cannot be God if God is unjust. That is an article of faith for me. So my friends and I decided to open the Quran once again with feminist eyes to search for answers to the problems confronting us, the challenges confronting us as believing Muslims. And really for us opening the Quran, going back to the text, to the word of God, it was actually the most liberating experience for us to discover numerous verses in the Quran that we were not exposed to in our upbringing, yeah, that provide for an ethical vision of Islam advocating the absolute moral and spiritual equality of women and men. So there were verses in the Quran which talk of common identical spiritual and moral obligations placed on all individuals regardless of sex, which declares that men and women are members of each other, which describes Muslim women and men as each other garments, that that close to each other like the clothes on your back. And the final verse that was revealed on the relationship between men and women, you know, which talks about them being each other's awliya, protecting friend and guardian. And the obligations for both men and women to enjoy what is just and forbid what is evil, to observe regular prayers, to pay the zakat, the tithe, and to obey God and his messenger. And they will, they will all be equally rewarded. These were verses that were unequivocally egalitarian in spirit and substance and we felt reflect the quranic view on the relationship between men and women and then there is also the egalitarian vision um, on human biology the verses on creation in the quran talk about men and women as characteristics of pairs in creation. The Quran does not talk about Eve coming as an afterthought from Adam's rib and the most crooked, crooked rib, you know, some believe. Since everything created must be in pairs, the male and female must both be necessary, must exist by the definition of createdness. Neither one comes before the other or from the other. One is not superior to the other, nor a derivative of the other. This means that in God's creation of human beings, no priority or superiority is accorded to either men or women. These are incredibly empowering verses in the Quran. So the question that we you know, ask is, if we are equal in the eyes of God, why are we not equal in the eyes of men? What happened? What happened to the ethical voice of the Quran, which insistently enjoins equality of all individuals, even if it means going against your own personal interests or your parents or your relatives? These are all, you know, message in the Quran. Justice is such an important principle and objective of Islam and Islamic law. How did this voice become silent? and largely absent in the body of political and legal thought in Islam. When women decided to read the Quran for themselves, they discovered this ethical message of equality and justice in Islam. They began to question why this voice was silent in the exegetical and juristic texts of the religion and in the codification of the teachings of religion into public law. Who decided? that these verses in the Quran shall be shunted aside. Why couldn't these egalitarian and compassionate verses be used to guide the laws governing marital relations in Islam? Who decided the verses that could be read as discriminatory towards women will be the source of law and public policy? In making these choices, whose interests are served, protected, and advanced, and whose interests are shunted aside? 
Is this really about living the will of God on earth as this man in authority would like us to believe? Or is it really more about how the word of God could be used, should be used to perpetuate patriarchy and male dominance and resist the changing realities galloping before their very eyes? I'll be damned if I'm going to keep quiet with this new knowledge and awareness. So what I want to share with you today really is the courage and the will of Muslim women who are taking the lead in the Muslim world today to define how religion is understood and practiced and who are demanding that our experience of living Islam and being impacted by laws and policies made in the name of Islam give us the right and the authority to decide and shape what Islam means and should mean in our daily lives and as a source of law and public policy in our own countries. It is because women have borne the brunt of this suffering in the name of religion that in many parts of the Muslim world today, it is women who are organized and are at the forefront of our societies in pushing for change in the understanding and practice of our religion to recognize equality and justice and to push for law reform to uphold these principles. But of course, bringing change is never easy. Those who have benefit from, benefited from the status quo are resistant to change and use all kinds of tactics to demonize and delegitimize the voice calling for change. But re the reality is women's lives throughout the world have changed. And I'm, as I'm saying this, I'm like thinking that all of you in your own Indian context, Hindu context, Buddhist context, I mean, this must be familiar. Yeah, this is really in the end about patriarchy and how religion is conveniently used to justify patriarchy. And we're all suffering from the consequences of that. Our realities, our needs, our roles and status have changed. I don't need to provide the litany of statistics to show this transformation and how, how having women on boards and management positions actually increase productivity, efficiency, and even profit margins. The compelling case for gender equality is there. How in reality today, women are both protectors and providers for their families that most families, except for the most privileged, cannot survive on a single income on the male provider, of the male provider. For many of us who have decided to engage with religion to fight for our rights, it is our art of faith in a just God and a just Islam that have made us embark on this perilous but compelling public struggle to push for an understanding of of Islam that recognizes the urgent necessity that we Muslim women must be treated as human beings of equal worth and dignity. Why is that such a radical notion? Unbelievable. We believe these principles and ideals of equality and justice are intrinsic in the Quran and are also upheld, of course, in universal human rights principles that regard all human beings as equal. For us, what could be more Islamic than the first article of the UN Declaration on Human Rights, which states, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Again, the question I ask, if we're equal in the eyes of God, why are we not equal in the eyes of men in this world? And this is the challenge, this is the huge challenge we face today. How do we as Muslims reconcile the tenets of our faith to the challenge of modernity, of plurality, of changing times and circumstances. Can the teachings of Islam be reconciled with the realities and aspirations of women living in the context and the realities of the 21st century? So I wanna share quickly share with you the work of Musawa and Sisters in Islam, the Malaysian NGO that gave birth to Musawa, and the incredible efforts of the activists and scholars who have been engaged in the production of new feminist and rights-based knowledge in Islam, and creating, so they're not, that knowledge is not sitting on the shelf. With that knowledge, the effort to create a public voice at the national and international levels pushing for the possibility and necessity of reform of Muslim laws and practices. 
what we have been doing is to bridge the seeming divide yeah, between Islam and human rights, Islam and women's rights, and break what we believe is a constructed binary. As if all the forces of evil are on one side and the forces of good on the other, and we have to choose one or the other. It is this voice that is challenging the intolerance, misogyny, conservatism that dominates much of what constitutes authority in the Muslim world today, and therefore the ways Islam is understood and practiced. It is led by Muslim women activists working closely with scholars, advocating a review and critical reinterpretation of the exegetical and jurisprudential texts and traditions within Islam. This work places emphasis on how religion is understood, how religious knowledge is produced, who produced it. It's not from God, it's from men, M-E-N, most of it. And how rights are constructed in the Islamic legal tradition and how they can be reconstructed. It locates the production of religious knowledge in the social historical context context of its time and asserts that given changing times and circumstances, new religious knowledge needs to be produced to deal with new challenges and questions and issues that the tradition and the scholars of Islam in the classical period had not dealt with. And not least, of course, the issue of equality between women and men. What makes this work exciting is that it is not done at not done just at the theological level, but it is cutting edge work at the intersection of theology with law, politics, and gender. The group I co-founded in Malaysia, Sisters in Islam, spearheaded groundbreaking work by creating a public space and a public tradition of debate on matters related to religion at a time when nobody had the courage to do that. We take the position that in a country where Islam is used as a source of law and public policy, every citizen has the right to participate in how the religion is understood and used to make laws and policies that govern our lives. We conduct regular study sessions and trainings to build knowledge on a rights-based understanding of Islam that upholds equality and justice for women. We write letters to the editor, issue press statements, embark on campaigns to challenge laws, policies, and statements that use Islam to justify discrimination against women. And we run a legal clinic as well that deals with over 800 cases a year, providing women with gender-sensitive legal advice to enable them to access their rights under the Islamic family law. What we have <coughs> achieved over the years is really to break the stranglehold and the hegemony over matters of religion in a society where traditionally we have been brought up to believe that only the ulama, the religious scholars, and men at that have the right to speak on Islam. We take the position that if a state wants to rule in the name of Islam, then the impact of these laws, policies, and practices must be open to public scrutiny and pass the test of public reason. The pioneering work of Sisters in Islam in Malaysia has had a global impact. In 2007, we led the initiative to form Musawa, the global movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family. Given, given the frustrations and opposition Muslim women activists face in trying to push for reform of discriminatory Muslim family laws and the issue of women's rights in Islam, we felt it was high time that all of us have for decades struggled against patriarchs and government, society, and our private lives who use religion to justify discrimination against women, that we needed to come together and create a very collective public international voice demanding our right to equality and justice. Thus, Musawa, which means equality in Arabic, was launched in February 2009 in Kuala Lumpur with over 250 participants, you can see in that picture there, from 47 countries, including 32 member countries of the OIC, Organization for Islamic Cooperation. What Musawa brings to the larger women's and human rights movement, and in fact the Muslim world, is this, an assertion that Islam can be a source of empowerment, not a source of oppression and discrimination, an effort to open new horizons for rethinking the relationship between Islam and human rights and equality and justice, 
an offer to open a new constructive dialogue where religion is no longer an obstacle to equality for women, but can be a source for liberation, a collective strength of conviction and courage to stop governments and patriarchal authorities and ideological non-state actors from the convenience of using religion and the word of God to silence our demands for equality. And a space where activists, scholars, decision makers, working within the human rights or the Islamic framework of both can interact and mutually strengthen our pursuit of equality and justice for Muslim women. Since 2009, when Musawa was launched, we have gained an international reputation for our groundbreaking work in knowledge building, capacity building, and international advocacy. Musawa challenges patriarchal interpretations and understandings of Islam from within the tradition. We link scholarship with activism to bring new perspectives on Islamic teachings, inserting women's voices and concerns into the production of religious knowledge and legal reform in Muslim contexts. We use a holistic framework, you can see that the Musawa framework for action that integrates Islamic teaching. So we argue the possibility for reform, for justice, for equality, using Islamic teachings, universal human rights standards, contemporary state constitutions and laws, and the lived realities of women and men today to argue for the possibility of reform. Our groundbreaking publication, Man in Charge, question mark, Rethinking Authority in Muslim Legal Tradition, has received raving reviews from major Islamic scholars. And within a year of its publication in 2015, at least 22 universities in seven countries were already using the book as text or reference for various courses in Islamic studies and um, Islamic law and, law and society and all that. The book has been translated into Arab and gained public attention as well in the Arab world. And currently, our age building team on a new research initiative to develop new ethics and jurisprudence. We're currently doing a whole series of webinars on this research project to you know, expose the public to a wider discussion of these issues. From deconstruction of knowledge, Musawa is now entering a phase for constructing new knowledge for our times and our realities. Musawa also works in two other key areas, capacity building and international advocacy. Zul is in charge of capacity building here. Our seven day short course called Islam and Gender Equality and Justice aimed largely at women's rights and human rights activists who already understand gender and human rights, but have very little understanding of Islam from a rights perspective. Many, for many Muslim women, the only Islam they know is the patriarchal Islam they grew up with. And on the basis of this, many of them have rejected the possibility of engaging with the religion as a source of reform and empowerment. But of course, as they find out, as we all find out, religion has not gone away from our lives and our societies. So in the past 10 years, we have trained over 300 participants from 35 countries. Um, you know, and, and, and many find this course life transforming, you know, th that it is possible to be Muslim and feminist and it renews their faith in the possibility that Islam can be just to women like them who want to remain in the faith and still stand up for equality and non-discrimination. In the area of international advocacy, Musawa is engaged deeply with the CEDAW process. Um, I'm not quite sure whether you all know the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination um, Against Women. India has ratified CEDAW and does report to the, to, to, um, the CEDAW sessions. We did a major research on CEDAW and Muslim family laws, critically examine, examining how Muslim countries have used Islam, Muslim governments have used Islam to justify reservations and non-compliance with treaty obligations. And we critique that approach and offer the Musawa framework for action as an approach that reconciles Islam with women's rights and provide the conceptual legal tools and language to argue for the possibility of equality 
and justice and reform of Muslim family laws. Today, Musawa regularly submits thematic reports on Article 16 of CEDAW on marriage and family relations whenever key Muslim countries report before the CEDAW committee or key minority groups yeah, in, in other countries. Musawa has existed for 10 years now. As we enter our next decade, we are focused on amplifying our voice globally and accelerating our impact on the ground. We have just launched a new campaign for justice in Muslim family laws to build global momentum, to recognize the urgent need for family law reform, bringing together activists, scholars, and policymakers in South and Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Arab world. We're really excited about the organizing and mobilizing we will be doing to build this campaign, and not least to build new public support and new voices demanding for equality and justice for women in Islam. And we're linking this campaign with the new global campaign for equality in family law that's, you know, that's just been, that's just had its soft launch. And this will bring together women's rights groups from all religions, cultures, and traditions from all regions of the world dealing with the intractable issue of family law reform. And we've got the backing of UN Women as well to undertake this project. The gendered impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has un unmasked the long-standing inequalities in the family. And this is manifested in higher rates of domestic and intimate partner violence. This is recorded in all countries, how suddenly there's a spike in phone calls to spike um, to helplines. Increased care burden, I'm sure you know, some of you might have experienced this, plays on women that are both unfair and unsustainable in the long run. And of course, increased women's financial insecurity under lockdowns as a result of women's overrepresentation in the informal sector and care and service industries. They just don't have any income. And you know, this has also exacerbated online gender-based violence and children's sexual abuse. Grooming, online grooming has increased as well. Yeah. So women's and girls' suffering has been magnified exponentially and across multiple areas of life during this pandemic. All these more than ever underscore the importance of addressing family law as a critical area of reform. There can be no equality in the public space for women without equality in the private sphere of the family. Major global research has shown that the worst performing countries at the bottom of so many gender equality surveys are countries whose family laws continue to discriminate against women. The time for change is now. I would like to urge you to visit the websites of both Musawa and Sisters in Islam and to really learn and understand more about the transformative change that is taking place both in scholarship and activism in the Muslim world. And also what's going on with the Muslim sisters in your own country and what you can do to amplify their voice and their struggle yeah, for justice and equality. Don't forget that the Muslim population in India is actually the world's third largest Muslim population after Indonesia and Pakistan. You know, the Arabs are always shocked to find this out. Why, why, why? We're not the biggest Muslim population in the world. Sorry, no, <laughs> by far. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and the struggle continues. And in spite, you know, the risks to our own lives and liberty, Muslim women today are asserting that if Islam is to be used as a source of law and public policy, then everyone has the right to sp speak out and need to speak out. And our experience of living Islam, really, the authority comes from, you know, where all this question, what authority, what right do you have to speak on Islam? You didn't go to Al-Azhar, you didn't go to this Arab university, that Arab university, you don't even speak Arabic, let alone, you don't even cover your head, you have no right to speak on our Islam. But we always make the claim that our experience of living Islam gives us the authority and the right to speak out, to shape, to define, and influence what it means to be Muslim in the 21st century. Be a part of that change to make your country and the world a better place for all. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Zaina. And, uh, you know, 
listening to all that you have to say, I think the one thing that I'm sure all of us will acknowledge is that it's a, it's a stupendous task. Uh, to, set, to set out to do what you've set out to do, I think uh, with the amount, the number of people, number of stakeholders who would not want you to succeed, with the number <laughs> of people that you're looking to benefit right it's just a huge huge task right so maybe i can just start off with the questions and you know everyone else can just raise your hands and uh, I'll, I'll get the first one in and then i'll keep coming to everyone's questions and on chat or on raised hands but the first thing that was coming to my mind uh, zaina and again whatever little i have read of uh, read of islam and um, and what i do a little bit of i know about it is that there is there are these so many uh, madhabs right uh, so many th uh, legal theories when you're looking at laws um, you've got the Ismailis, the Zaidi, the Idabi, the Hanafi. And again, I'm, I'm not going to go on and on, but effectively, there are just so many uh, madhabs that one needs to look at uh, when it comes down to uh, making, making any sort of change in Islamic law, the interpretation thereof. Uh, how are you actually going about it? And, how, and what is it that we're looking at? Are we just looking at saying that there's a core law that uh, Islamic uh, Islam or uh, those who follow Islam should be following um, and then the impact of that on women or are we actually looking at each one of these and saying that you know with respect to this uh, Ismaili mother or with respect to Idabi, Hanafi so on and so forth these are the kind of things that perhaps need to change for um, for things to be more equal yeah, I mean, for us, you know, the Quran is the fundamental source, right? So anything that contradicts what the Quran says, you know, cannot be superior um, to the Quran. But of course, the tradition, you know, is a very important tradition that you cannot just shunt aside. There's an incredibly rich legal tradition and actually a very sophisticated legal tradition. All these schools that you mentioned are actually schools of law. Yeah, but they're not the same as divine word of God. They are human effort at interpreting the word of God to guide us to live a life as a Muslim. So there's the scholars of that time, and that is like the beauty of unearthing our tradition. The scholars of that time never ever said they are perfect, that their word is the last word. In fact, there's a legal maxim what I say may be right, what you say may be wrong, what you say may be right, what I say may be wrong. And there are incredible um, traditions of how um, Imam Shafi'i, when he moved from um, Baghdad to Cairo, which was a far more cosmopolitan city, how his rulings change. So all these legal concepts that we that and, and practices from the classical period are extremely important for us in the 20th. So we're not, you know, pushing the baby with the bath water, that there are incredibly rich um, teachings, rich principles, rich legal concepts that exist in the tradition that can be applied today. For me, for us, the most important thing is, you know, does this lead to justice? Is this just? Does this make sense in the context of today? If we say Islamic law is supposed to bring about a better world, is supposed to bring about justice, then for us, anything that is done in the name of Islam that causes harm, that causes injustice, cannot be Islamic. So yes, we look at the Quran, we look at the juristic traditions, we look at the different schools of law, and it's not easy, of course, you know, but in the end, what, the, what is the right decision? What is the right legal opinion to take? What is the right interpretation of the um, of the Quran to take, it really depends on the realities of today. What is the objective? Is the objective to continue discrimination against women? You're going to find so many, um, uh, you know, um, interpretations and thick opinions, you know, legal opinions to justify discrimination. But if the objective is to, um, you know, bring about a just world, is to end discrimination against women, again, there's this rich body of legal thought and legal opinions from which you can choose. So in the end, the issue is the political will to make the right choice for the kind of country that you want to live in or how you want to treat the women citizens of your country. So for me, the answers are there. 
within the tradition, within these human rights treaties that all our governments have signed, signed um, the constitution that guarantees equality and non-discrimination, and yet in reality, you completely ignore that, there is a lack of political will. But the tradition, I don't, you know, that there, there, there are, of course, the traditions that are very, very discriminatory, interpretations that are discriminatory, but these are all opinions. This is not God's command. These are opinions by scholars of the time to reflect the situation of their times. Given a changing time and changing circumstances, there is so much in the legal tradition, the sophisticated legal tradition that talks about public interest, that talks about choosing the best opinion among differences of opinion. There are so many legal tools and concepts from the tradition that actually the Muslim community should be so proud of because that those tools didn't exist um, in the Western world at that period of time, that classical um, period, yeah, um, that it's there for us to choose. It's, it's the political will, you know, for us to choose what is right, what is just um, for all of us. Yeah, understood. And, you know, this, this reminds me of what one of, one of our participants actually, uh, who's not on call right now, um, has, has as what he, what he says to us. He says that if, if you want to change read Prophet Muhammad and read the Quran. So and that's what really what you're saying is you have to go down to the root and that's really where everything begins from and everything else thereafter is, is interpretation, of course, which there are learnings from as well, but you have to yeah. go down to the Quran if you really want to understand what's being said. Uh, Ishan, you've got a hand raised, so why, why don't you unmute yourself and ask your question? Can you guys see me? I'm sorry. Yeah, hi. Hi, uh, so then it was really nice um, hearing, hearing you talk. So I, I fell into this dichotomy when you were actually talking. So I found that you, 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 you mentioned that when we are looking at the Quran, that should be taken into a higher prestige because um, in, if, if you are, let's say, um, a follower of, of Islam or you believe in Islam, then that's the word of God in that sense. But then the question that Ramit posed to you, let's say there's so many uh, interpretations uh, of Islam, let's say, and I'm not, and I'm not well versed with it in that sense, mm. but they, they don't really, let's say, uh, look into what the Quran had to say or something along those lines. But, and I, and I quote you in some sense, you said that we have to look at the Quran, but even if, uh, when we say that, because, because let's say the times we are currently living in, mm -hmm. we may have to, let's say, change uh, by looking at other legal procedures in that sense. So my, so my question here is that, at, at what point, because we can look at different religions, we can look at Hinduism, Christianity, and other aspects who talked about this essence of homosexuality and, and fears against uh, that in that aspect. So my broader question is that whatever teachings there are in the Quran or, or, or whatever religion there is, after a point, don't you think that we will eventually have to move away entirely from the Quran and not even take it as, let's say, the foundation that what you guys are taking and maybe raise kids in a secular manner? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if it's if it's uh, clear or yeah. um, I mean, the way you know, we separate what is eternal, what's the eternal principles and message of the Quran, and what is contextual. So we believe that the eternal message is justice, is compassion, is equality. Um, you know, and 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 if discrimination against women today, treating women rather dif differently today, you know, brings about injustice. If treating um, LGBTQ people of, you know, in today's context is regarded as an injustice, as discrimination, then if, if you want Islam to remain relevant to the lives of Muslims today, you've got to choose an understanding of Islam that fulfills the principles of justice, of equality, of compassion. Yeah, you need to do that search. If not, then forget about Islam, you know? So, so this is the challenge that we pose to the religious authorities. Why, why would the citizens of a Muslim country want to be governed by Islamic law when your laws discriminate against half the citizens, when your laws discriminate against those um, you know, with different sexual orientation and gender identity. Why? We would choose democracy. We would choose human rights. We do not want your Islamic law in the way that you define 
um, Islamic law. But the problem is that for many Muslims, and even for me, someone like me, who is a feminist, who is a human rights activist, I cannot divorce myself from my religion. You know, and this is, this is faith. <laughs> it's, it's, it, the faith is inside you. You grow up with faith. You cannot easily discard it. And even for the women that we train in the, in the seven-day short course that we do, it is a life transforming change. You know, many of these women basically have left, you know, say, forget about Islam. You know, I've not opened the Quran in 13 years. I've not touched the Quran in seven years because you find the way the religion has been taught as discriminatory, as unjust, make no sense to the realities of your lives. So you have said, forget about the religion. But the religion remains inside you because you were born with it. You grew up in the tradition, you know, and so it gnaws inside you the injustices. So you could choose, yes, forget about the religion, but then when you're exposed to the possibilities of equality, of compassion, of justice in the religion, you know, some of us feel very compelled that this is the understanding of Islam that we want to push forward. So the, 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 the eternal principles of justice, of equality, of, of, of compassion, of kindness. In fact, Muslims say in the name of God, the most kind and the most compassionate so many times a day, but it doesn't translate into deeds. So this is our challenge. How do we translate that compassion, that kindness, that justice that is so insistently enjoined in Islam how do we translate that into the realities of our lives? So you can choose to forget Islam, like no, at some stage, forget the Quran. There are no answers in the Quran. Or you can continue to do this struggle and to bring our lived realities and pose that challenge of dealing with our realities today you know, and pose that challenge to the religious authorities. Do you want to make Islam relevant or do you want it to die? As it has died, you know, religions have died in the Western context, you know. So this is a challenge that we are doing. Um, and who knows, at some stage, maybe I'll oh, forget it. I'm just too tired to do this anymore. And there are many people who are just too tired or never got tired and didn't even bother to engage. But at this stage in my life, um, you know, this is, this. For me, it remains an exciting struggle, yeah? And, and, and for me, it's what makes my life meaningful. And, and it's a continually learning process. It's intellectually challenging um, for me. And um, so, yeah, it is a challenge. And I will understand, you know, why many feminists, Muslim feminists, who feel that, oh, forget about religion. You know, how far, you know, we've always been told, you know, for every... Um, interpretation you can offer, the mullahs can offer a hundred other interpretations. But if we don't engage in the religion, in our society where religion is a source of law and public policy, then we are complicit in the, 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 the discrimination, in the extremism, in the conservatism that dominates our society because nobody is challenging that misogynistic, conservative, extremist, intolerant voices. What we're not doing is challenging that hegemony that they have over matters of religion and taking it as far as we can go, you know? And we're pushing and pushing and pushing the boundaries and that what needs to happen in Muslim countries. We have to have this public voice that is critical in challenging the dominant, misogynistic, unjust, patriarchal, intolerant voice. And for us, if we get this debate going on in many Muslim contexts, that's a huge success because we live in a context where our voices don't matter. So to just get these voices out there in the public space and you know, cause some misery to the ulama, to the religious leaders, to the patriarchs, that's major, major achievement in the path towards change that needs to take place. Can I, can I get a follow-up question, Ramit, yeah, if that's sure. okay? Sure. Yeah, please, I had some context to add as well, but please, please go ahead. Right, so from what, what I'm gathering from that is that when you're, when you're looking at these things and you're saying that, okay, if this is wrong and doesn't fit into society, then we can go about talking about that because it may be very difficult to 
move let's say islam away totally because there are still a lot of good things to pick out of uh, mm-hmm. from islam uh, mm-hmm. the things you mentioned mm-hmm. but don't you feel that eventually we will come to a matter because i've seen this in an islamic context in that sense and and, and what i'm talking about is this indoctrination of religion that mm-hmm. in in every family as you were talking about family laws that it becomes almost um, in every family from a very young age it's 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 uh, it's processed down from the family and it's almost made a uh, culture and, and and the aspect of another of another viewpoint isn't entertained in that sort of way so what i'm saying that if you if you maybe if you maybe teach them in a secular manner and also show them that islam is 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 an entity but of course there's another way of looking at life don't you think that be better though because then they can they can think for themselves that is islam what i want to follow or is 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 a more holistic approach something i'm looking at well i think what we're doing is offering that holistic approach it's not this is not a theological debate of um interpretations um of the quran this is about how islam is used as a source of law and public policy and our approach to reform is a holistic approach that uses islamic principles and islamic teachings human rights standards constitutional guarantee of equality and non discrimination and the lived realities of women and men today in fact we approach the quran from context so we approach the text from context we're not just looking at the text in isolation and try to understand what does god mean here in this text it is there's a problem polygamy causes harm to women women and children are being harmed and they are unhappy so how could god say that polygamy is a right of men in islam i'm asking that question what does god actually say yeah in the context when it causes harm the same with domestic violence you say the quran say a man has a right to beat his wife to discipline his wife but this causes harm to women how can a god that is just an islam that supposed to be just an islamic law that is supposed to bring a ju- um injustice that is supposed to bring justice cause harm to women so we're questioning it from the context of today where women can will not accept that they are inferior women will not accept that their husbands have a right to beat them or the husband has a right to a second third fourth wives so we're dealing with those harm that's been caused in the name of islam and challenging them by asking them to look at you cannot interpret your islam your understanding of the quran without looking at the lived realities without looking at the constitution that recognizes equality and non discrimination without looking at the human rights instruments that the government has signed yeah and promised to make all this reform you need to look at all these issues because we live today in a modern nation state but similarly can't they simply say that in my opinion this is the word of god and hence i am portraying it in the best way possible um, so who are you to no, say that it, god does you, then you're saying that you are god if you say this is the word of god no is your understanding of the word of god so this challenge is so important the quran you open up the quran or any of your texts it doesn't speak the book doesn't speak those are just words on paper they're god's words the minute you speak and you say this is what god says it is your understanding of what god says and just as me as a feminist i have a prior text in my mind when i open the quran i'm noticing all the egalitarian um verses in the quran all the incredible values of compassion of justice and all that in islam a man who wants to have four wives who wants to have multiple sexual partners he will zero in on the verse in the quran that says marry two three or four but i'm a feminist i'm a woman who suffers polygamy i will read the quran and find out in the very same verse god says and if you fear you cannot do justice marry only one and that will be the best for you so how can marry two three or four becomes the law of islam and if you challenge it you're against islam but marry only one and that will be best for you is not the law of islam who gets to decide so in the end this is about power and authority and 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 you know men wanting to maintain their privilege yeah and using the text 
to justify and to silence dissenting voices. So, you know, it is, it is just so important and so critical that we understand that what is taking place now is how the religion, you know, I don't care if we live, if we live in a secular state where there's total separation between religion and politics, religion and state, where the ulama and the religious scholars and what they interpret, what God says, doesn't matter to me, I can choose to ignore it, then I don't care. You go ahead and do your, all your theology that you want. It doesn't, because it doesn't affect me. But when Islam is used to govern my life and to punish me when I disagree, then I have the right to speak up and to challenge you and the basis in which you choose your understanding of Islam to govern my life and affect my life. So that live reality is extremely important. It is not a battle of verses and a battle of interpretations only. It's about how do, how, what is the role of religion in a modern nation state where you live in a global environment, where you sign international treaties, where you have a constitution that promises equality and non-discrimination. That is a challenge that we need to place the role of religion in. Yeah, no, absolutely, Zaina. And I think that's just really what I wanted to also just pinpoint. The, the very first thing that you said, right, that the, the Quran is, um, has verses that are eternal and verses that are contextual, right? I think that's also extremely important to understand. Yeah. Because invariably, you know, of the 6,000 plus verses in the Quran, a lot of what we read about, you know, whether it's, again, as you talk about polygamy, you talked, I, you didn't talk about, about, about the hijab that I, I keep, that's the example that I keep giving. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of what's written there is not eternal but contextual, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what is, and because it was the word of God coming down in the context that existed at that point of time, right? Mm -hmm. And when that is being used as the eternal word of God, that's really where your interpretations come into play, where we need interpretations uh, to come out to try and explain to people, you know, guess what? Of the 6,000 plus verses in, in the Quran, there are only three verses that talk about the hijab. And they're all in, in a, from a contextual standpoint. They are answering questions with respect to a particular thing. If that particular thing doesn't exist, then perhaps the hijab also is not something that is an eternal word of God, but really something which one needs to look at in your current surroundings, in the way that things are and so on and so forth, and determine for yourself whether that's something that needs to be done. And same thing with polygamy. What you said is, is spot on. Why do people not talk about the fact that God has told man what is best for, for him in this context, right? And uh, for man to then choose what may not be best for him, and the other obligations that are imposed upon having a, a polygamous uh, marriage, right? And those obligations go out of the window. It's only the rights that remain, which yeah. is what the men end up concentrating and focusing on. And, you know, just, just to Ishan's uh, point as well, right? Very quickly, and then we'll move on to Inayat, uh, who has a question to ask. Um, Ishan, at the end of the day, right, and was what Zaina effectively ended her part with, right? Today, Religion is being utilized by people, by those in power, right? Whether it's the clerics, whether it's the ulamas, whether it's the it's just politics of our, all our countries, right? Um, to try and create a sort of situation where injustice is being meted out. The one way of doing this is what you what you said is saying that look, I don't believe in religion, so please don't talk about this with me. But they're still going to talk about it with you because guess what? There are so many others who believe in religion as well, and that's the reason why they're in power. That's the reason why they're the ones who are making the laws, who are interpreting the laws, and so on and so forth. So the only way, perhaps, and I'm I'm putting sticking my neck out and really saying this is the only way is to talk to them about what they believe that they understand what they're doing. So they talk about religion, talk to them about religion again. They talk about the Quran, talk to them about the Quran again. Right? But that's the only way you get more and more people to actually understand where you're coming from because you're not, it's like cancel culture, right? Right, Vishan, uh, what we keep talking about, right? It, it, you can't have cancel, a cancel culture of those thoughts, right? The idea is if you're having a conversation with me about a subject, Let's talk about that subject itself. So if we're talking about the Quran, if we're talking about Islamic laws, let's talk about them and see how they need to be interpreted, right? And that conversation, in my opinion, is the only way to actually have change um, come about by convincing them that what you're saying, what you're saying itself can also translate and mean what I am saying. And then we can reach a place where there can actually be equality without deviating from our underlying faith, which is faith in the Islamic God. Right, because that that is common for for both of us. In the See, I'm sorry. I know Anayat has a question here, but 
so when you when you touched upon this essence of let's say uh, understanding and talking to them about religion because that's the only way we can we can have constructive dialogue in that sense but when, and i think uh, zaina pointed out as well or and, and many people have pointed this out that if if someone is believing in a religion then they believe that whatever their religion has to say is in let's say what what god had to say and and, and it's only the interpretations we are taking out of it so when they are actually considering that to be more superior than any other documentation that's ever been written how are we expected to have a dialogue in that sense eternal, right no? the answer to that is is uh, the whole idea between eternal and contextual so as what what zaina said very clearly right you know justice um, equality um, all of these are inherent in in the religion as well and everything needs to be looked at from from that that light and then when you're looking at an interpretation that's those are the questions that are being asked that need to be asked how is this just how is this equal right and when your interpretation is not just an equal then how is it that that is the interpretation that god intended for us in that sense right i don't know again sorry and, I'm, I'm, I'm and, and if i can add when we're engaged in this debate you know we're not interested in changing the mind of these people they are beyond redemption they don't want to change what we're doing is changing the public mind we want to expose the public to a different understanding of islam that is the public support that we need to build the public voice that we need to build so like for us for sisters in islam especially every attack against sisters in islam and look we're currently under a fatwa that made sisters in islam as you know illegal and and you know and in you know basically where 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 we we don't have the right to exist there's a fatwa against us um they banned our book but every attempt by and this is by the government right to silence us we take them to court we challenge them you know is and for us winning is the icing in the cake we want the book banning case yeah um it's just an icing for us the most important thing is to open up the public space for debate to open up the minds of muslims that there are other different interpretations of islam to show the religious authorities that we are not scared of you you do not hold the monopoly over what islam means and that we citizens who are affected have the right to speak on in this on this issue so is really to get voices more voices to speak out and to expose muslims who've been dominated by only a misogynistic patriarchal understanding of islam to diverse interpretations and diverse points of view so for us that is so critical as an outcome of our work you know so it's not like getting the most ideological extremist misogynist um religious scholar to change his mind because we know we're not going to get him to change his mind but we want to sow seeds of doubt seeds of critical thinking in the minds of the citizens of women in particular who are affected by this discriminatory and misogynistic understanding of islam that there are other ways of understanding islam and this is so critical because we grew up in a tradition where we think whatever the mullah say is the gospel truth is the divine word of god it is not the divine word of god so breaking that myth that what the mullah say is what god says what islamic anything with the label islamic law islamic family law islamic criminal laws and all that must be divine law so breaking all that myth that this is not divine law this is man made law man made interpretation man god does not sit in parliament to pass these laws man sit in parliament to pass these laws so how dare you say is god's law is not god's law is your interpretation of god's what you think is god's law so this is this is an important critical debate that has to take place to build that possibility of reform of change towards equality and justice sounds good inayat uh, uh, should i uh, yeah yes please uh so uh, i have a, a little um, i'd say a little spiritual question also in the sense of it uh that um, there is one thing that there's a lot of anger in anger and frustration that definitely comes along with uh people have, women having faced discrimination for such a long time 
and uh, now uh, feminists tend to find it fight it very uh, freely but like you said you have a perspective of religion and islam in itself which stands for justice and compassion and all these things right uh, so uh, how did you uh, so like for example like there must be an anger against the people who for example try to ban the organization and everything but at that point uh, how do you internalize islam to really like to have compassion and still fight for what you feel to be right at that point uh, because compassion is what is islam teaches and to fight for justice that is also what islam teaches how do you uh, strike that balance um, <laughs> um well that's a very good question actually you know uh, it, it's you getting this this okay maybe first is the article of faith yeah that i believe fundamentally that god is just that islam is just so i think that that internal faith is extremely important for you to do this work because you know why would you want to suffer you know all these consequences of doing this work being called an infidel being called a, uh, you know uh, anti god anti sharia um, you know anti islam anti everything yeah you're labeled you're demonized you know so that article of faith that that what you're doing is right that you really you know believe in a just god and in a just society um and that you see women suffering on a daily basis yeah because of this misogyny that is justified in the name of islam i mean it's ridiculous we live in malaysia where the non muslims who form 40% of the population are governed by family laws that recognize men and women are equal and for muslim women were governed by an islamic family law that does not recognize equality this is unacceptable yeah so in a way is this anger um and outrage at the injustice that actually drives us on you know turning that rage and that anger into activism into change you know one just and this asked me once um you know whether i was i was a born leader and i said no i was born a rebel i was just born to rebel from you know from day one of my life but it is i think in the end is the injustice that drives us on that this injustice cannot be accepted yeah and 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 of course the act of faith you know in a in a god that is just in an islam that is just um and knowing the realities of where we live the context in which we live religion matters islam matters to the women we are trying to help you know so to try and ask them to tell them to fight for justice for equal oh forget about islamic family law let's move towards a civil law great if that's possible but we know it's a non starter in our context we have to live with the system so how do we make it better for women who are most affected so it's the knowledge that you know god is the belief that god is just the knowledge that reform is possible in islam that there are this sophisticated legal tools and concept that exists within the muslim legal tradition that makes reform possible knowing that you know we that society on the ground is changing is galloping you know before us women's realities have changed so knowing all this that you know i'm driven by hope and by the reality that change is taking place yes it is not as fast as you would like it to be yes we tell when we do our training we tell the women you know to be ready to be attacked you need to be strong and you need to be ally so to take strategies as well you know i mean when sisters in islam began 30 years ago we for a long time we were the only people speaking out on islam and women's rights islam and human rights islam and fundamental liberties nobody else dared to challenge the voice of those in authority today we have so many groups in malaysia that are speaking up on these issues of fundamental liberties if not on women's rights we even have in fact i'm telling my friends in all the other countries form this group we help former retired 
senior civil servants, generals in the army, judges, secretary generals of ministries, ambassadors, to come together to form a group. They call themselves G25 because they started with 25 people and now they're over you know, 80 people, to come together to speak out and challenge the ways, you know, the direction that the country is taking with this conservative, intolerant, extremist Islam that is a danger to the plural society in which we, lo- we live in. So it is important, you know, what Sisters in Islam has done, you know, at the global level with Musawa to show yeah, that this change is possible, that we need to bring this culture of debate and to show others in the Malaysian context, this is an Islam, to show others that once you've opened the public space, you cannot close it back. You cannot turn back the clock anymore. You know, that it, it is just expanding because the reality on the ground has changed. So the fact that several attempts to shut down Sisters in Islam have failed really is because there's resonance to the work on the ground. Yeah, and it is this, knowing that we're relevant, knowing that there's resonance, there's a need for us on the ground, that is what keeps us going. And that's where the energy is, is coming from too, you know? Yeah, and absolutely. And I think, you know, it's that energy and what you're, what you're really doing. Uh, where, and I just want to put this out there as well. I, 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 I don't follow the Islamic faith, right? But I don't need to follow the Islamic faith to follow what you're doing right uh, to support what you're doing because at the end of the day it all whatever faith one may follow uh, whatever belief one may one may hold even if someone is an atheist uh, and is not even a theist right still in terms of just the objectives that uh, that you're trying to fulfill i think that's really what needs to keep everybody going irrespective of whether they follow the islamic faith faith or not yeah. but uh, having said that i think uh, kartika do you do you want to go next Yeah, so um, well, my question stems from uh, my very personal uh, experiences uh, with religion, uh, personally. I've never been a, a very religious person, but at the same time, I have n- never liked uh, to be called a non-believer as well, right? So when you were giving the introduction and you said that there are a lot of feminists who turn away from religion, but uh, somewhere down the line, you couldn't turn away from God, right? And I believe that I can completely um, relate to that uh, emotion. But then the question comes, um, is God and religion synonymous, right? Then can they be seen uh, separately? And can we find God without religion as well? <laughs> and when we, uh, you know, when we ask such questions, and the reason I uh, ask this question is because, um, and I might sound a bit skeptical, but... Um, when uh, you do a cost benefit analysis of even having religion in a society, you know, um, even when there are voices like yours who try to uh, destigmatize, who try to bust a lot of myths that uh, that has been, you know, in the popular narrative, but those popular narrative have had a very great impact at a global level. Those are not only uh, disillusioned, you know, maybe the, Ill, uneducated or the illiterate, but also the educated part of the society. And that harm continues to be done. So uh, the question essentially would be that if we can find God without religion, why would we insist on continuing with, you know, dealing with religion or dealing with the flaws that, or de- dealing with the problems that it tends to bring to the society? or to mm. Well, that's a big, profound question. (laughs) Um, You know, I mean, there's religion and there's religion. You know, there's religion in terms of the faith that you have in your God, whichever God you believe in and whatever scripture you believe in and how you understand. You know, that's why many people talk about a private relationship, um, you know, with God. I think the 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 problem that we have today is with institutionalized religion and how the authority of God has been conferred or claimed by men usually, you know, who have institutional authority, who have millions of dollars of public funds, yeah, um, to impose this particular understanding of religion and worse still, in Muslim context to turn it into law, 
to turn it into public policy and to punish you, um, you know, when, when, when you disobey that law and that policy. Um, you know, and that, that is the, the difference that we have, you know, in terms of, you know, what's happening in the Muslim world and what's happening um, um, in the non-Muslim world. And I think what makes it particularly challenging in the Muslim context is that, you know, um, you know while, while in other contexts, maybe even in India, the Hindu context, you know, the laws are secular, but Hindu beliefs and Hindu culture still influence, you know, how rights are being exercised. But in the in, in, in Muslim context where the law itself is derived from the teachings of Islam, uh, you know, trying to like, you know, make that separation is is even more challenging and and more difficult. I think it is possible to reach an understanding of God without, you know, through the, um, um, without the, the medium um, or the pathway of institutionalized religion. Certainly, you know, you, you know, you sit at home and you pray to God, you know, on your own, you know, in your own context, you know, the, 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 and, and, and you have your personal relationship with God. But I think the challenge that we have in terms of trying to um, remove religion um, uh, from the public space or, or communicating with God without religion, it, you know, in the Muslim context is so much of what's happening, you know, in our context is really derived from the institutionalized religion. You know, and, and of course, there are people who feel like, you know, leave, you know, you know, if, if you, you know, leave me to my God and forget about the place of religion in the public sphere. But in the, in, and, and, you know, but in the Muslim context, in, in many Muslim countries where religion is used for law and public policy, you know, that really becomes, you know, difficult to, to do that separation, you know. So I guess you reach to your God, you have God without institutionalized religion in your private relationship with God. Yeah. Um, so um, I think now that I think that that's, that just sounds uh, in my at least in my opinion of what I've heard so far. Um, you started by saying that it's a profound question. I think the answer really is uh, is quite simple in that in that overall sense, right? And I think uh, I don't know, Kartika, if that actually answered your question. If you'd want yeah, to, yeah, I'm not quite sure if it answers your question to Kartika. <laughs> uh, I mean, I get the I get from where the answer comes. Um, yeah, I mean, I understand as to how some societies religion has become kind of inalienable and how difficult it might be to do away with it. But, you know, then uh, you, we always need to keep an open dialogue, you know, just because it's so difficult right now, doesn't mean it's impossible. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, I think that is a possibility that we need to uh, at least explore. Yeah. Because, um, I, I, because I, okay, I, I uh, study in Lady Sri Ram College. And I think um, I was just thrown into college life and I realized the kind of diversity that an individual can witness. And even then, when I, when I actually started talking to people who were, you know, who belonged to a particular religion, it, even at that point, I realized that how even in liberal societies, religion can, uh, you know, disillusion some people, not all, yeah. but it has an effect. And I just feel that even though it might seem very difficult right now, it's a dialogue that does not deserve to be, you know, shut down just because it seems difficult to yeah. know. No, I absolutely agree. You know, in the same way that, you know, we, we also engage with our feminist friends who feel that our work is a waste of time, you know? Um, and there are many feminists, including Muslim feminists, um, you know, who think so, um, you know, but we feel that in the end, we're all trying to achieve the same thing. Yeah, we want justice, we want equality, we want a kind of, you know, um, fair society. And there are many paths 
to the same end, you know? And so we need to respect the different paths that people are taking. If people just want a private relationship with God, take that path. If people just want to use human rights principles, take that path. People want to combine, combine human rights and religion, take that path. I think there are many paths. I mean, the problems are so huge and monumental. The struggle is so big. Um, you know, patriarchy has existed for thousands of years and we're still not there, you know, to end patriarchy. So there are many paths to reach the same end. And I think what needs to, to happen, like you said, is to open the space for dialogue, yeah, and for understanding, you know, and to try and reach common ground that what is it that we want in the end? And how best in our context can we achieve that common end? And can we, is it possible for us to work together to achieve that common end? So definitely opening up that space for dialogue, for understanding, for reaching out in the end to reach the same goal of justice, of compassion, of kindness, of, of equality. You know, that, that in the end is that end that is the most important goal that should be able to, you know, allow people with different approaches, you know, to come together and respect each other's approach. No, absolutely. And, and then well, just speaking of the dialogue, we're, uh, we're already about 30 minutes over time, Zaina. So I really hope that this is okay. We've not infringed too much upon your time. But if you do have a few more minutes, there are a couple more questions for you, if that's okay. Yeah, there's a question here from Inayat about verses in the Quran. What I will do is I will email those verses. In fact, some of the points that I was making about men and women being each other's garment, being each other's protector, all those are Quranic verses in the Quran creation. So I will just, you know, email you and just give you some of these of these verses that we use and we question why aren't these verses used and interpreted you know, into law as, as a source of law and public policy. Why the verses that have been interpreted as discriminatory towards women are the only Islamic vision of what a male-female relationship, um, marital relationship um, should be like. So I will share with you those um, verses, yeah? I'll, I'll email to you, okay. That will be very useful. And uh, Tisha, because we did speak about feminism uh, in bits and part, but uh, so she's got a question where she's asked, that um, in a lot of a lot of countries have had conversations about banning the hijab, and uh, some of them have as well. Um, and invariably, the reason that they give is um, because is 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 pro uh, uh, women in Islam, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, as a feminist as well, what Trisha asks is that uh, if there is an outright ban, uh, and if it's been put, and the reason for that is put on the women themselves, then where does the entire freedom of choice go in in that in that mm -hmm. entire space? Because mm -hmm. for someone's interpretation uh, of the Quran and of the Word of God or whatever else, they're individual, independent, yeah. for themselves, mm -hmm. may actually be to uh, to wear the hijab. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I mean we yeah we don't agree. Well, you know, in sisters in Islam, we certainly don't agree um, with a ban for the state. I mean, the state basically we take the position that the state has no role to play in forcing women to wear the hijab or forcing women to take off the hijab. It should be the personal choice of the women and what we hope, of course, an informed choice. So the, the, the strategy in terms of dealing with it is really about, again, you know, we, the way we understand the verse on the hijab, the verse on hijab is that it doesn't prescribe the hijab. So we have a different understanding of that verse and we popularize that understanding um, you know, and we bring up as well, like, you know, one of the very important um, piece of knowledge that we unearthed was the fact that during um, the classical period, slave women were forbidden from wearing the hijab. Why? A slave woman's aurat, the parts of the slave woman's body that um, should be covered is the same as the men between her navel and her knees. Her breasts cannot be covered, you know, and because, and, and, and because, you know, a slave woman who covers up her breast is seen as pretending she is an upper class woman, a protected woman. You know, so it was an issue of, you know, of, of to denote class that, you know, if you're covered up, then you're a protected woman from the upper class, you will not be disturbed in the marketplace. So a slave woman who covers herself up 
pretends that she's an upper class woman and you know she can be punished for doing that so so in the end is it really about every woman or is it something else that is you know that made this call for wearing the hijab so we don't believe that wearing the hijab is compulsory we believe that it is um, choice and it should be the free choice of the woman we believe that the state has no role to play in either to force the hijab or to force people to 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 take off um the hijab um you know and 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 you know we've taken you know when the french government imposed um the hijab ban you know we've taken sisters in islam has taken public positions um you know opposing um those that it really should be a, a choice yeah well I absolutely agree with, with, with you Sam on that so okay so i don't want to take too much more of your time but um, the final question that we do have to ask you and put you on the spot really uh, before we let you go and since this is the fair project uh, mm -hmm. and we've spoken so much about equality and uh, uh, justness and so on and so forth what are your thoughts on fairness for you in all that you're doing by maybe in your personal life what does being fair actually mean and what does that word connote uh, to you personally Wow, I guess it's really about having empathy, trying to put yourself, I mean, you know, do unto others, you know, what you want done to yourself or don't do unto others what you don't want, you know, have to happen to yourself. I think that's important to, you know, to ask yourself, you know, if you treat a person in this way, do you want that person to treat you in the same way um, or not? You know, so I think to have empathy, um, to put yourself in the other person's position. Um, you know, you know, fairness, in, and I really believe that feeling is inherent in you. Kids know when they're treated unfairly. You know, when, when their little brother gets a bigger share of the cake or gets a special toy. Nobody taught them that. But they get so angry and so outraged, you know, when, 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 when you know, they, they feel that they're treated unfairly. So it's important. I think, I think being treated unfairly and not being able to voice out that this is an injustice to you, it really causes a lot of harm internally. So I think it's so important that we all of us make that conscious effort to really be fair, to treat other people fairly, and then to ask if you're not so sure, is this right or is this wrong, to really ask yourself, you know, would you be happy if someone does that to you, you know, to have more empathy about how the other person, you know, might be feeling, might be thinking. Sometimes it's easier said than done, you know, in the work that I do, oh my God, you know, trying to listen to the other side and not understanding why what I'm saying, I think I'm making a compelling case, why can't you understand? You know, like what is wrong with you, <laughs> you know, trying to, and it's, it's tough, it's tough, it's a challenge. But I think just by being aware of the other side and how they are feeling and thinking, I think that that is a start, you know, to try to be fair, to try to be just and not think only about yourself and what your needs are and, and how to satisfy your needs. So I think, yeah, you know, really having empathy for the other person is uh, important. Thank you so much, Saina. That's, that's extremely useful. Uh, mm -hmm. I did tell you that was the last question, but I've just got a text on my phone uh, separately while you were talking, saying mm -hmm. that before I let you go, I must ask you uh, about your understanding of equality versus equity. Now, I have absolutely no idea why this question has come in, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, equity has had a bad meaning, um, you know, because... Um, you know, there's equity and equity. So, you know, I, of course, believe in equality, but I do believe, um, you know, that if someone is differently situated, he or she needs that advantage, you know, that help, you know, to jump um, that hurdle. But equity in the Muslim world is a bad word because it means inequality. 
It's not affirmative action. It is not substantive equality. It means you, are, you will be treated differently, not because you're differently situated, you know, you're disadvantaged as a woman. You will be treated different, differently because you are inferior, you're lesser than a man. So that word is a very problematic word um, for Muslim feminists because of the way it is used by conservative forces within the Muslim world to say that you cannot have equality, we can only have equity. So women are naturally born to be caregivers. So don't expect women to work outside the home and be the income earner and be the provider because, you know, um, she, she, she is made to stay at home. And that constitutes equity. It's complement. The man is a provider. The man is a protector. The woman is the obedient wife. That's how they define equity. Each person has a role to play. The man has his defined role. The woman has her defined role and don't clash and both of you want to be leaders. One is leader, one is false. So that's how they understand equity. So for many feminists in the Muslim context, we don't accept equity and we stridently choose equality. And that's also why Musawa is called Musawa. It means equality in Arabic because we just want to make it clear that what we believe in is equality and not equity in the way it is defined um, by those, you know, um, uh, conservative um, um, scholars and activists. All right, Zaina. So, uh, as I said, this is absolutely the final question. No more, more questions uh, for you. I know I've said that thrice already, but thank you so much for coming on. And Thank you. I think it's been absolutely fantastic for me and for everyone else. And uh, the one thing that I would definitely want to say to you on behalf of all of us here, please continue to do the good work that you're doing. I think um, all that you have spoken of, all that we've read of previously as well, this is extremely fantastic work, which is it's very much needed. And someone has to be doing this in the manner in which you're doing it, at the extent at which you're doing it, and with the dedication with which you're doing it. So thank you so much for all the work that you do as well, more than, of course, just coming on and speaking with us, of course, as well. But um, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And at any point of time, if there's anything that you need from us at any st step of the way, uh, we're all here. Right, so we'll be more than happy to uh, to step in and, and help in whatever way possible. Uh, I'd also like to thank Alex and Zuleika for coming in as well. Um, thank you so much uh, to the both of you, also, and um, hopefully our paths will cross again at some point of time. I hope so when the skies open up. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's really a privilege. I love talking with young people, um, so it's really, really a privilege to to meet all of you and you know, for you to spend your time, your afternoon um, with me and with us here in Musawa and sharing the work that we do um, you know, to try and make the world a better place. So thank you so much. Um, and really is a great project what you guys are doing. I love that idea. In fact, I'll be sharing it with some of the young groups that I work with here. Look, hey, they have this fair project. I think this is a great strategy, you know, to learn, you know, how to listen to other people and how to be reasonable and rational in, in making decisions, you know. So, yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I really wish all you young people the very, very best. Um, your life is just beginning, it's just opening up. So seize the day, seize the opportunities and stand up and speak out and don't accept any injustice in any guise, any form. Speak out, listen to your heart and speak out. Yeah. Thank you so much. All the best bye. to you. Bye, Zaina. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye, bye everyone. Bye, Rami. Bye, everybody.